What's up geeks and welcome to the channel. In this last introductory system design interview video, we are going to cover several terminologies and concepts you may encounter. We are not going to fully dive into each one as most probably you will not be asked a detailed or dive deep question about them. However, it is important to have a basic understanding of these topics as they might be mentioned during the interview. The first item on the list is network protocols. Network protocols make it possible for network computers to talk to each other, no matter where they are or what hardware or software they're running. They do this by establishing standard forms of sending and receiving data over the network's physical infrastructure. Before we describe the specific protocols, we'll need some context on where they fit in network infrastructure. Therefore, we're going to go over the two most common models of networking that present a framework for how internet communication works. Both models we're about to discuss divide the network stack into layers, with protocols defined at each one. This enables communications at the highest layer to deal with application-related concerns and not hardware-related issues. This way, protocols can do their respective work and rely on the other protocols to continue the flow without having to know how they work. First, the TCP IP model, also known as the Internet Protocol Suite, is one of the oldest networking models and greatly influenced the development of the Internet as we know it. This model is defined by four layers and their associated protocols. What you see is the layered representation of this model. Let me know if you'd like us to dive deeper into these in a separate video. The second model is the Open Systems Intercommunication Model or OSI model. It has seven layers which allows more specificity than the TCP IP model. OSI doesn't specify protocols and many popular protocols don't fit in one or more of their layers. Now that we've gone over the TCIP and OSI models, let's go into how some of the most used protocols work and how they fit into these models. First, the Internet Protocol or IP is the key protocol that allows computers and different physical networks to communicate with each other. It's defined in the Internet layer of the TCP IP model and corresponds to approximately layer 3 of the OSI model. IP defines and works with the fundamental data unit of a packet. It also provides addressing in the form of IP addresses, so packets can be correctly routed from their source to destination. An IP packet consists of a header and some data. The IP header contains information including the source and destination address. The data is formatted and contains whatever is useful for the next layers. Next is the Transport Control Protocol or TCP, which manages reliability of data transferred with IP. TCP is defined in the transport layer of the TCP IP model and corresponds to approximately layer 4 of the OSI model. TCP works by first establishing a connection between the client and server, and then transferring data. It builds on IP by adding guarantees that data messages are delivered reliably, in order, and checked for errors. If the application needs faster data transfer and doesn't require a confirmed connection, it can use the similar User Datagram Protocol or UDP instead. UDP works at the same layer as TCP, but has no guarantees about data delivery or ordering, which works well for situations like broadcasting. Third and last network protocol is the Hypertext Transport Protocol or HTTP, which allows application to view and modify data over the network. HTTP corresponds to the application layer of the TCP IP model and layer 7 of the OSI model. To use HTTP and its secure variant HTTPS, a client makes a coded request to a server which sends back a coded response. HTTP requests and responses are divided into the header, which contains metadata about the request, and the body, which contains data in some specified format such as JSON. HTTP methods specify what kind of request is being made. The key methods are get, a request to read data, post, a request to create the data passed in the body, put, a request to create or update data with the one in the body, and delete, a request to delete the specified data. HTTP status codes indicate what kind of response has been sent back. They are three-digit codes that are grouped by the first number in the code. So, for example, a response starting with a 2 indicates a successful response, such as the famous 200 OK, and a response starting with a 5 indicates a server error response, such as the 500 internal server error. OK, the second topic on today's list, besides networking protocols, is proxies. A proxy is a server that sits between a client and application server to provide some intermediary server to the communication. There are two kinds of proxies that provide different services, serve forward proxies and reverse proxies. A forward proxy sits between a pool of clients and the public internet. The goal of a forward proxy is to protect the client pool by filtering outgoing requests and incoming responses. For example, a school network might decide to block requests going out to certain websites. 
On the other hand, a reverse proxy sits between the public internet and a pool of servers. Because of their location in the system, reverse proxies can provide several services including load balancing, caching, filtering requests, attack prevention, etc. For example, if a company wanted to expose a public API for querying data but not modifying it, they could filter out any non-GET requests before passing them to the servers that generate the responses. Okay, performance is an important concept in system design, and it's also a common topic that comes up in system design interviews for tech roles. Therefore, in the second part of this video, we'll go over three standard measurements of system performance, latency, throughput, and availability. Latency is the amount of time in milliseconds it takes for a single message to be delivered. The concept can be applied to any aspect of a system where data is being requested and transferred. For example, in a distributed system, we might be interested in the latency of a database returning the results of a query. If the database is a substantial source of latency, this could indicate that we need to add an index or choose a different database model. But what causes latency? Physical distance is one main cause. You see, the speed of light is the fastest anything can travel, so no matter how you design your system, transferring data through space will always take some time. Complex computation. If a computation is complex, it's going to take longer to execute and increase latency. For example, a complex relational database query with lots of joins will take longer than a simple lookup by ID. Congestion. When there are many message requests coming in at once and the system doesn't have the capacity to process them all, some requests will have to wait, increasing the latency. Either these requests will be dropped and sent again, or they sit in a queue waiting to be processed. Latencies can be caused by lots of other factors, however the main takeaway I want you to part with is a basic understanding of the difference between latency, throughput, and availability. Speaking of which, throughput is the amount of data that is successfully transmitted through a system in a certain amount of time, measured in bits per second. Throughput is a measurement of how much is transmitted, and it is not the theoretical capacity or bandwidth of the system. Latency, throughput, and bandwidth can be easily confused, but it's very similar to a system you're probably already familiar with, traffic of cars on the road. Latency is how long it takes you to drive from A to B. Bandwidth is how wide the roads are, and throughput is how many cars are on the road right now. So what causes low throughput? Just like latency, congestion plays a big factor. Road traffic is caused by many people trying to get to the same destination, Similarly, low throughput in a software system can be caused by too many requests on the same network. Essentially, the hardware can't handle the number of requests going through it. Latency can cause low throughput. Since throughput is the amount of data transmitted over a set period, high latency, i.e. slow data transmission speeds, will reduce the amount of data that is transmitted overall. To improve throughput, we can increase the bandwidth or the capacity of a system to transport data, or we can improve the latency. Finally, availability is the amount of time that a system can respond, that is, the ratio of uptime over uptime plus downtime. Availability is a critical metric of performance for a service because downtime can both harm users who rely on the systems and cause a business to lose large profits in a short amount of time. The gold standard for high availability systems is the 5 nines, or 99.999% uptime. This looks like an excessively precise number, but 90% of uptime is about 17 hours of downtime a week, and 99% is about 1.7 hours of downtime a week, which is a fair amount of time for a service to be regularly unavailable. 5.9's availability can be misleading though if it's not balanced by other aspects of performance and user experience. Uptime doesn't matter that much if it takes a minute to respond to every user request, so it's important to make sure good latency and throughput are maintained while designing a highly available system. Downtime happens when part of the service breaks. Examples may be hardware failures, software bugs, complex architectures, dependent service outages, request overload, deployment issues, etc. A solution to partial system failure may be redundancy, which makes sure that if something goes wrong, there's a copy of it so that the system can continue functioning. Okay, the last couple concepts we're going to briefly cover in this video are queues and pop subs. Both are mechanisms that allow a system to process messages asynchronously, which basically allows the sender and receiver of a message to work independently, eliminating bottlenecks. In message queues, producers push new messages to a named first-in, first-out queue, which consumers can then pull from. Message queues are also called point-to-point -point messaging because there is a one-to-one -one relationship between a message's producer and consumer. There can be many producers and consumers using the same queue, but any message will only have one producer and one consumer. A simple example of a message queue could be a website that sells a high volume of t-shirts. Consumers make online orders for a t-shirt and the web server produces corresponding order requests and places them in a queue for processing in the back end. 
Each order only needs to be processed once, so only one of the order fulfillment servers needs to take the order request of the queue. If for some reason multiple fulfillment servers got a copy of an order, that order would be mistakenly fulfilled multiple times. On the other hand, the publish subscribe pattern, also called pub sub, pushes a producer's newly published messages based on a subscription of the consumer's preferences. There is a one-to-many relationship between publishers and subscribers, meaning any number of subscribers can get a copy of a message, but there's only one publisher of that message. PubSub doesn't guarantee message order, but guarantees that consumers will only see messages that they've subscribed to. Many social networks already use parts of the PubSub model and call it following users. Whether to use queues or PubSub depends mostly on how many consumers the system has. If a message needs to have only one consumer, then the message queue is the right approach. If a message needs to have possibly many consumers that get a copy, the PubSub approach is best. Stay tuned for the next video of the series in which we will start solving architecture and design interview questions. So that's it for this video. I hope it was helpful. Thank you guys for watching. Take care and I will see you in the next one.